Hello, I'm Suzanne Dickinson, and I am an instructor here at the EVMS Ultrasound Education Program, and today we're going to be covering uh, general MSK and learning about tissue signatures that you can then be familiar enough with to be able to get through the rest of the MSK series in the Ultrasound Bites series. So today we're going to be going over, of course, an introduction to the clinical applications and um, we will also look at those, as I said, the sonographic signatures of MSK tissues so that you uh, will be familiar every time we look at them um, in succeeding uh, ultrasound bites. And um, we'll look at machine setups and options that you have. Uh, MSK does have some additional options of regular scanning. And um, we'll look at patient setup and acoustic windows as well as a few pitfalls and pearls uh, that may help you as you move forward through the program. So first of all, we're going to go over the clinical applications. So the purposes of an MSK a sonogram I can include quite a few things, but for POCUS, you might be looking for nerve compression or tendinopathies or um, tendon and ligament tears, joint diffusions, and you may even want to determine if that lump that the patient feels under the skin is within the subcutaneous tissue, like a lipoma, in which case it's not something that you would worry too much about, right? Um, and or you can be checking to see if it's within the uh, muscle layer, in which case you might want to refer that patient for further evaluation. So those are some of the uh, uh, applications that you can use MSK. Now, before you, before you can evaluate, you want to have a firm grasp of the relational anatomy, as well as the sonographic signature of bone and muscle, and uh, you'll want um, tendons uh, and ligaments, be able to recognize those, and nerves. And um, the skin and subcutaneous tissue will go over last, uh, because you want to be able to distinguish what layer you are in uh, of, the, of the tissue layers as you move from anterior to posterior. So let's begin with um, muscle and with bone. Uh, these are pretty straightforward, but let's look at this in both uh, long and transverse. So when we are in long axis, as in the image above, you can see the fascicles of the muscles and this alternating bright and dark areas. So the bright areas are going to be your collagen connective tissue and your darker areas are going to be the muscle fibers themselves. In transverse, when we look at muscle, it's often described as um, starry sky appearance. And um, this, you, that's because you're cutting through all of that connective tissue and you're seeing um, uh, a sort of dotted appearance if you were looking up at the night sky and that's why they describe it. Bone, on the other hand, will be a very, very strong reflector. And when it is in a transverse, you're going to see the curve of that bone. And when you're in long axis, you're going to see a nice straight, bright line as most of that sound beam is reflected back and the rest of it gets quickly absorbed by that, the high density of the bone. And so bone and muscle, fairly straightforward. Let's move on now to um, other signatures, and that would be our tendons and our nerves. And let's first look at them in long axis. And they're really very quite similar. So they're going to be both densely packed um, bright lines, and those are going to be the connective tissue wrapping of fascicles. Now in the nerve, as in the um, uh, median nerve dis displayed here, the darker lines are going to be made up of the um, nerve tissue itself. But in the tendon, it's a little bit more irregular, those darker areas. And that's because that's going to be some loose cerebral connective tissue that is often the result of that wrapping effect of the endotendineum. So, um, and note too, at the bottom of this, we might as well show you, look at the, note again, the uh, surface of the bone can be easily seen in this as well, the carpus. So we see the radius and the, um, uh, and the uh, lunate here. Right. 
These are often described as fibular, so if you see that name uh, in, uh, in your text or whatever else you are reading, they're usually referring to these two uh, structures. So know your relational anatomy and know their function. And the reason I say know their function is if you're just looking at a static image like this one is, um, the median nerve and that the uh, flexor tendon deep to it look very similar. But if you moved the fingers, you would note that that tendon will be sliding underneath the nerve. Let's look at these same tendons and nerves in transverse. So when we look at them in transverse, you'll see the tendons will again display in these multiple bright punctate echoes, and they're very, very close together. And you can really appreciate it as, uh, with the median nerve above it, um, how much brighter that it is. You will sometimes see a hypoechoic halo around the tendon sheath. That's just, um, that's pretty common when you see a tendon. So that's another telltale sign. And again, that is just some um, loose areolar tissue between the tendon sheath and the tendon fibers themselves. There's the nerves, on the other hand, are often described as honeycomb appearance. And if you look at this classic honeycomb with our favorite um, uh, pollinator, you'll see that there is a real similarity to those alternating patterns of the darker, more hypoechoic nerve and the, um, the collagen uh, tissue that's wrapping those nerve fascicles. And so it's described as a honeycomb appearance. But even though in the top image, you get this more hypoechoic appearance re relative to the surrounding tissue when you're in the carpal tunnel, when you move into a surrounding tissue of muscle, which tends to be a little bit more hypoechoic, or, or let's say lower mid-graze, your honeycomb appearance of the, of the uh, median nerve can appear quite bright as it sits between the two muscle groups traveling up the anterior arm. So let's talk about a little physics in regard to MSK as to why sometimes your, uh, the structures you're looking at may be bright or may be dark. And is it a result of the surrounding tissue as it is in this bottom image, or is it something you're doing with your probe? And what I mean to be talking about here is anisotropy. So anisotropy is a type of refractive artifact. And um, when um, you are not ex uh, precisely perpendicular, the sounding's not precisely perpendicular to the fibers that you're looking at. So remember, these are very bright reflecting collagen fibers. And when you are directly on them, they should show up as bright, uh, linear densities all packed in together. But if you are off a little bit and you're not hitting it at a direct uh, 90 degree angle, you'll have uh, what occurs is uh, um, a refracting of those uh, uh, waves and they don't come back to the, um, uh, to the probe. And so as a result, you make it look as if you have no tendon there and you lose that fibular pattern. Now the tendon sheath around it is still a very strong reflector, so a lot of that does come back, but the ones, the, the tinier fibers that make up the tendon itself will become very hypoechoic, and um, you're going to, to lose uh, their appearance, and you don't want to misdiagnose here. So in this case, uh, a simple heel toe to get yourself perpendicular to the tendon will um, help you in this case. But let's say uh, we're looking at um, this knee, for instance. So this is, uh, in the top image, you have a nice perpendicular incidence to the transverse patellar tendon. And you again see those punctate fibers that are um, also a signature of the tendons. But if you uh, are not at this direct 90 degree angle, the tendon will appear quite hypoechoic. And you don't want to misinterpret that hypoechogenicity as some kind of edema or some kind of pathology that's going on with the tendon. So anisotropy is, is critically important to understand uh, with um, uh, uh, ultrasound. And to improve on the image uh, with the knee, that would be like a, a fanning maneuver. 
and uh, you can straighten out the probe right directly onto that tendon. So let's go back to sonographic signatures a little bit because we went through most of them already, but I want to talk to you for a moment about subcutaneous tissue. So when we're looking at the skin and fat layers, um, they can display in very clearly defined tissue planes, although the appearance of this subcutaneous fat can depend on where you are on the body. So it can have a, a little bit of variability to its echogenicity. Um, and so in this example here, you can see that for the most part, on most parts of the body, the um, skin, first of all, the skin layer is going to appear as this very uh, bright but somewhat heterogeneous um, uh, line uh, just underneath your probe. Now there's a gel pad on this so that you can see the um, skin layer very well. But you can see a very, very sharp transition from the um, epidermis and dermis to the hypodermis or the subcutaneous tissue. And um, that, that fat, for the most part, will be mid-gray to maybe slightly below mid-gray with lots of intervening um, uh, um, um, linear densities that, that are just supportive to that fat. And so, uh, again, it's going to be mid-gray, sometimes a little lower mid-gray, depending on where you are in the body. You're going to have those linear densities. But the thickness, that's going to depend on where you are in the body. And uh, so you, in this case, um, if you're just looking at something that's in the subcutaneous tissue, be sure to optimize that by putting your focal zone there. Now, different appearances, such as in this particular image, you can see the skin layer. And here it is a bright line again. And uh, it, it is um, somewhat heterogeneous. But then you can look at that subcutaneous tissue. Now, this is a much thicker layer of tissue, so we're more at the lower uh, mid grays. And um, then below that is the rectus abdominis muscle. And you would, it, um, you, if you felt a mass uh, and you put your probe on there, what you're looking to find out is whether or not that that mass is going to be directly in the subcutaneous tissue. It may even be in the skin layer or is it in the muscle layer? So if we look at an image like this, you can see um, the fat layer, and there appears to be some variation in that fat and depth, because in a case like this, lipomas can be very similar in echotexture to the surrounding tissue, but you're able to see their border well enough to be able to distinguish it from the other fat tissue or subcutaneous tissue. And in this case, you can see that this lipoma does not break through uh, any uh, plane into the muscle layer. It's clearly within the, the um, between the skin layer and the muscle layer. All right, for our machine setup, um, the usual uh, um, uh, applies as they uh, when you set when you're stepping up to a machine you're going to be entering your patient information and the probe selection is going to be the linear probe for any of these structures and there is a preset for MSK and you should try to choose the MSK when it's available um, but if only superficial is available you can you can pick pick that as well what where it changes the most is in the depth that it starts off with you want to be sure that your depth and your gain and your focal zone are kept at the default before you start scanning and that your TGCs are aligned centrally. You can adjust all of that when, as needed when you begin scanning. Now, patient position, this is going to vary. So you want your patient in a, um, you want your patient as comfortably as possible and uh, for ease of, of scanning in the area of concern. You may need to use some pillows or rolled towels for support, and um, the and um, and you may even have them sit in a chair and put their arm, if you're looking at something on the arm, resting on the bed. The probe marker by convention in, in MSK is that long axis always points proximally, while in the transverse axis you can rotate you rotate the probe 90 degrees counterclockwise. Now. Remember that that probe, when we're talking about long and short axis, is that we're talking about long and short axis relative to the structure that you're looking at. So you may have to do some pivoting with your probe and or some sweeping and fanning 
and some heel toe. Remember that heel toe is going to help you uh, avoid anisotropy or even that sweep and fanning will help you avoid some of that anisotropy. So your acoustic window is pretty straightforward. You're looking at superficial structures, so you're just simply putting your probe um, over the area of interest. And there shouldn't be anything blocking your way, usually. But if you're scanning a tendon um, that, say, in the neutral position, uh, the person has a, their, their, their arm or leg in a neutral, or in a neutral position, um, if it lies under a bony structure, you may have to rotate or extend the joint or um, any a number of maneuvers that will actually expose that tendon uh, to your probe. And when you're scanning superficial masses, this is where you want to be sure that you are scanning exactly what the patient is concerned about. So make sure they put one or two finger pads directly over the area of concern, and you put your fingers on that area too, and place the probe in between your fingers so that you're directly over the area of concern so that you can you, you make sure that the two of you are talking about the same thing. Some pearls and pitfalls. Don't start scanning until you've entered all the patient information, you've selected your preset, and you've centered your TGCs. And always, and this is critically important in MSK, be aware of anisotropy. And so this is a very dynamic kind of scanning. You want to always be sure you are shifting and adjusting your probe at all times so that you are looking at the tissue in its expected echogenicity. And you want to set your gains for the muscle tissue to be at that lower mid-gray. Or you may set the, um, the, the subcutaneous tissue to be at mid-gray. And then your muscle layer would probably at, be at that lower mid-gray. You also want to set those tendons to a bright fibular pattern, so that they're at a bright fibular pattern. You set your focal zone at the posterior aspect of the area of interest, and move it as you follow the nerve or tendon proximally. And be aware of the relational anatomy, because in some areas of the body, uh, your nerves and tendons can have a similar appearance, but if you know uh, what you can do dynamically or and you know your relational anatomy, you'll be able to pick out which one is which. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Ultrasound Bites, and we'll see you in the rest of the series of MSK.